who you are and for what you have done. And indeed, this morning's sermons, Lord, have also reminded us that um, we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. And also that our entire life, Lord, is indeed a spiritual act of worship to you. So, Father, Lord, we just pray, uh, even as we live our lives, you continue to, uh, to allow us to do so. And our life will be one that is uh, pleasing and acceptable to you. Uh, for today's session, Lord, with our brother Stephen, again, we thank you that he's able to um, teach us and lead us in, in your truth, Lord. And today's session on praying God's word, we just pray that we have meaningful time learning together with our dear brother. And we just want to commit uh, this session to you. We pray and ask all this, giving you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, everyone, I'll mute everybody. And then, uh, Stephen, if you can unmute your self and then um, we can start right so we come to the penultimate uh, spiritual habit that is praying God's word um, to me this the um, calling on the name of the Lord singing to the Lord and praying God's word are um, a set for me it is a set of uh, three items uh, that is very close to my heart that I uh, put into practice all the time that it has become a habit. It's no longer uh, just a discipline. Uh, it has become a habit to call on his name, to sing to the Lord and to pray using God's word. So uh, praying God's word, uh, let's see something from uh, our Bible translator, the NIV Bible. So the NIV Bible has a blog post um, that promotes uh, uh, praying using scripture. The title is How to Pray and the, sub, and the subsection is How to Pray Scripture. As you can see, How to Pray Scripture. It says, Praying the word means reading or reciting scripture in a spirit of prayer and letting the meaning of the verses inspire our thoughts and become our prayer. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, we find instances of God's people praying the word by quoting scripture in their prayers. And we're going to look at uh, some of them, some of these examples today uh, in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. He says, uh, the, the blog post continues, our life should be soaked in God's word. So it is only natural that our prayers be filled with it too. If that makes sense. If our life were to be soaked in God's word, then it makes no sense that our prayers are not soaked in God's word. All the more our prayer should be filled with the word of God. In doing so, we can experience numerous benefits to praying the word. For example, it helps keep our prayers in scriptural proportion. Uh, we may tend to pray about the same few issues over and over and over, says Professor of New Testament and Biblical Theology, Andy Nasselli. But if we pray scripture as we read through the Bible, that will force us to pray about a rich variety of issues in scriptural proportion. That is the scripture emphasized or we may have some pet topics to pray over and over and over. But the Bible... It's a rich tapestry of topics, of different attributes of God, different reasons to give thanks to God, uh, to pray, uh, to petition, um, and, 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 uh, and it's very well balanced. And we want to balance our prayer in the same proportion as Scripture balances the topic. So if we pray through Scripture, it will help us do that. Uh, and this... Uh, is quoting from Professor Edin Nasselli, who has this um, article, 12 Reasons You Should Pray Scripture. This is uh, in the journal Familios in 2013, when he was still an assistant professor uh, and he was a research manager for Dear Cousin. He says, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a prayer expert, I'm not, but that's one reason I find praying scripture so helpful. Uh, is it precisely is because I am not a prayer expert. That is why praying the scripture is very helpful to me. He says, my argument is simple. You should pray scripture. 
uh, the gifts free qualification. I don't mean merely that you should pray. Of course you should pray. That's a given. I don't mean that you should merely pray scripturally informed prayers. Of course, that's also a given. I'm arguing specifically that you should pray scripture itself. Scripture is the content of your prayer. And he says, I'm not arguing that you should pray only scripture every time you pray. Of course not. Uh, we have we can form our own sentences and there are specific things that we want to pray for and petition to God for, of course. Or just talk to God about. Rather, I'm arguing that you should pray scripture itself often. And when you see the word often, it means it's a spiritual discipline. Right? It's a spiritual exercise, of course, but it has to be done in a disciplined way, often, until it becomes a habit. So why should you pray scripture? For at least 12 reasons. And he goes on to give 12 reasons why he should pray scripture. And the first reason he gave is that you should pray scripture because God's people in the Old Testament and the New Testament did. Okay, so let's look at how the um, Bible describes praying or meditating on the word of God. Psalm 1. So the book of Psalms, uh, the Psalter, is basically Israel's prayer book. Israel's song book. Um, and the, the arrangement of the Psalter is not random. Neither is, the, neither is our hymn book, the sing hymn book that we sing from, uh, it's arranged alphabetically. Uh, and the index is managed theologically, right? Category about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit. So there's a design to that hymn book. Likewise, there's a design to Israel's songbook, Israel's prayer book. And uh, it opens with some kind of a preface. So someone is the preface to the entire sort of. Uh, it's to invite you to pray, to sing the Psalms. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. A blessed person is not a person who joins the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers. That's not what he does. What does he do? His delight is in the Torah, in the law, in the teaching of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He meditates on Genesis day and night, on Exodus, on Leviticus, on Numbers, on Deuteronomy. And now we know that it's the, the, the Bible expands it include the psalms the prophets and the new testament the gospels the epistles the delight is in the word of god the word of the lord and meditates on it day and night which means all the time all the time day and night means whether it's their time it's night time this is something called merism merism means it is an all-inclusive thing by using two opposing poles of a spectrum, we talk about we are talking about the whole thing, right? So it's not just oh well, if it's the evening, it's either morning or night. What does it mean? No, all the time, meditates on it day and night. And the word meditate here uh, is like the word is the word ruminate, haga. It is like an animal masticating on food ruminating on food uh, and it is an action word it is it basically means to mutter to say aloud to say aloud the word of god for example uh the the ethiopian eunuch uh, he was on his journey home and he has his isaiah scroll open and philip uh, was told by the Holy Spirit to approach the chariot, uh, to approach the, the, the chariot, to approach um, 
um, to approach the Ethiopian eunuch. And he heard, Philip heard, that the Ethiopian eunuch was meditating on scripture, which means the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't meditating on it silently, rather he mutters it. And that is the traditional way of how to engage as many senses, as many of your five senses as possible, uh, the word of God, so that you can absorb it, right? So as you, as you mutter it, as you say it audibly, you hear it yourself and you say it, and you pro right? And you're reading the word. So with more senses that is involved, you're able to internalize or focus at the very least on what you are reading, on what you are meditating. So it's basically repetition, 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 muttering, muttering. Let not this book depart from your lips, Tur neither turn to the left nor turn to the right. All the day of your life, you are delighting in the word of God. And such a person is a person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. How do you avoid walking in the counsel of the wicked? By changing your what you're interested in. Why do you join the wicked? Because they're doing something interesting. The sinners, the scoffers, because they have a common hobby. So because you join the club, there's a common hobby. Rather, you shift your hobby to the word of God and you just meditate on it day and night. This person is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. So not just one stream, streams, streams of water. So the tree will always be watered and it yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. So the wicked, the sinner, the scoffer, they're not like that. They're like shaft that the wind drives away. The tree and the shaft can't be any more different. The tree is big, solid, strong, and full of life, full of vitality, produces fruit. The leaf does not wither, it's evergreen. The shaft is this lifeless husk, lifeless shell that the wind blows away. The wind here is ruach, or spirit. So it's kind of like a play of words that the spirit drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What differentiates the blessed man and the wicked man? The difference is what do you do with the word of God? The blessed man meditates on it. The wicked ignores it. It all comes down to what do you do with God's word. And the recommendation here is to meditate on it, to pray, to mutter it day and night. Here's an example of how the Old Testament believers prayed using scripture. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 16 to 21. Uh, so they came back from the exile and they discovered oh we we have we are no better but we thank the lord that the lord has brought us back and we want to do a public confession of sin and so they pray this is the prayer but they they pray to god they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery. What in Egypt? What are they doing? They're meditating on the book of Exodus, right? They're meditating on the story of the Bible. <clears throat> but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. What is this? This is a quotation from Exodus 34. And the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And 
he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children, the children for the sins of their parents, to the third and fourth generation. And here then, this particular phrase, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, is quoted in Nehemiah chapter 9 as part of their prayer. So the prayer is filled, soaked with the Bible. And this whole thing is just soaked with the book of Exodus. They're just basically meditating in their prayer, meditating on the book of Exodus, quoting specific lines, but meditating on the whole story. You did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Uh, this is entering into the book of Deuteronomy. This whole prayer is praying using scripture. It is not just biblically informed prayer, scripturally informed prayer. It is taking scripture itself as the content of prayer, to pray the Bible. The New Testament believers too prayed using scripture. They, uh, this was uh, Peter and John healed a paralytic uh, 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 a paralyzed man, right? Uh, the, with a, f a famous verse and song that I remember when I was like, when I was in Sunday school. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So then. They preach the sermon after that, after the miracle. What does this miracle mean? And they, pray, and, and they preach the gospel, and they were arrested by the Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin couldn't do anything about them because there was a miracle, and the people would be uproar if you punish these people who just performed the miracle. So they let them go with a strict warning. Never preach in this name, in the name of Jesus ever again. So then they went back to the people, to the rest of the disciples, and told them what happened. And in response to what they heard, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Uh, that itself is a quotation from the Old Testament, who made the heaven, the earth and the sea and everything in them. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, against the Lord and against his anointed. What is this? This is a quotation of Psalm 2. Just now we have Psalm 1, now we have Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot even the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. They didn't quote the last two lines because they know it's not going to happen. Right, they, they come together to be against the Lord, against the Lord's anointed, but they're not going to be able to burst their bonds or cast away their cords. Uh, and so it's a prayer of faith. But the point here is that the New Testament believers, they prayed using Scripture. So believers in the Old Testament prayed using Scripture. Believers in the New Testament prayed using Scripture. We too should pray using Scripture. Um... Oh, so having established that, uh, this is how I pray using scripture. Uh, I med how do I meditate on uh, 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 verses in the Bible, and thereby committing them to memory, to soak my life, to soak my day with the Word of God. Worship is a whole life. Uh, we heard this morning and prayer is a big component of worship all, all worship is, is, is prayer and how do we pray 
using the Bible to meditate on it, to mutter, to mutter, to keep on repeating and muttering the word of God. So here's Colossians 1, 13 to 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now it's very easy to just read through the whole thing and then go to the next verse and then go to the next chapter. And before you, are, before you know it, you're done with the book and it's time to move on to the next book of the Bible. No, no, no. Slow down in order to meditate on the word of God day and night. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So I will take that and I will slow it down. I will turn it into prayer. The, the, the verse says, He has delivered us. So I just turn this phrase to God in prayer. I say, Lord, you have delivered us. You have delivered. Not that you will deliver us, one day, not that you are planning to deliver us someday, but that you have delivered us. It's already done. Thank you, Lord, that you have delivered me. I am delivered. By faith, I declare that I have been delivered. He has delivered me. God has delivered me from the domain of darkness. Lord, I was in darkness. I confess that I lived in darkness. I was in the realm, the kingdom of darkness. Under the rulership, under the government of darkness. Being governed by it. Governed by sin. Governed by the enemy by the evil one. But praise you that you have delivered me from the domain of darkness, from that place, and you have transferred us to the kingdom of his, of your beloved son. Oh, I am right now in the kingdom of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, your son. He is the king. I am his subject. Now I am a citizen of the kingdom of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of God's Son, who loved me, who gave himself up for me. This is my king. Father, your son is my king. Lord Jesus, you are my king. I submit to you. I am your subject. Thank you for delivering me. Just as you delivered the Egyptians, under the dominion, the domain of Pharaoh and Egypt and slavery and death and violence with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, O Lord, you took them up from there through the Red Sea and transferred them into the promised land, into the kingdom of God. Likewise, Lord, you have taken me from the domain of darkness, delivered, saved, rescued, liberated me, and transferred me to the kingdom of your Son. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption. In you, O Lord Jesus, I have been redeemed. I have been bought back with a price, the price of your blood. Previously, I belonged to darkness. But now I belong to you because you have purchased me. You have redeemed me. You have bought me back. You have defeated the enemy. So now I belong to you. Lord, I belong to you. I surrender myself to you. In you, I have redemption. I do not seek redemption anywhere else. I do not even seek to redeem myself or find redemption in success in my work. Find redemption in, uh, um, in the way I raise my children to find some kind of justification for my life that my life has been worth the while Had, that my life amounted to something to require this 
things to justify my existence. I do not need any of those, Lord, because in you, I have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. This is so much. This is so rich. I have the forgiveness of sins. Lord, I want to confess my sin. I haven't drawn near to you as often as I should have drawn near to you. There's so many opportunity for me to turn away from my sin, from my addictions, from my wasting of time, from uh, the, the uh, nonsense that I speak, the nonsense that I watch. Sometimes the yearning of my, in my heart to associate, to walk in the ways of the scoffers, to sit in the seat of sinners, to walk in the way of the wicked, to be in their company, so that I get to enjoy some things that I shouldn't. I have sinned against you. But in Christ, I have the forgiveness of sins. You have delivered me from the domain of darkness and transferred me to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom I have redemption, the forgiveness of, of sins. And not just me, but it's us, the church, the people of God, the people right here in this, in this meeting, in this Zoom call. You have delivered all of us, O oh Lord, from the domain of darkness. You have transferred all of us, O oh God, to the kingdom of your beloved Son. We ha in, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So this is how I pray. This is how I pray. I allow the Bible to set the agenda of what to pray and allow the Spirit of God to move me to whatever direction that comes from the text. Maybe this verse moves you to confess all your sins because now you discover, you're enlightened that the Lord is speaking to you, hey, you have the forgiveness of sins. So take this opportunity, take this prayer time as the opportunity to confess your sins because in Christ, in the beloved Son of God, we have the forgiveness of sins. So how does praying uh, the word help you spiritually in many ways. Pray the word is prayer and it connects you to God. That is what it is. Uh, we are not doing something that is different from praying. It is exactly praying. And the Objective of praying is to have communion with God. So praying God's word, since it is prayer, it connects you to God. The content of your prayer is the spirit-inspired word of God. I don't have to come up with my own composition. Sometimes when I come up with my own composition, then I have to rack my brain for it. Half the time I'm composing a prayer instead of praying, right? Instead of Focusing on fellowshipping with God, I focus on composing a well-structured sentence that is theologically correct. Right? I don't have to do that. The content of my prayer is the Spirit-inspired Word of God. And God may speak to you through His Word as you pray, because it is His Word that you're praying. And as the Word that is in the Bible, the Logos, as you pray, it becomes rhema. Uh, one is like the constant word, the word of God never change. It's there in the Bible, those printed words. But it's no longer just on the shelves. It's no longer just in the pages of a book. Uh, always there, but it is now becoming it comes alive. It becomes God's word to you. It is always God's word, but now it becomes God's word to you. And it speaks a word into your life, into your situation, 
and it gives life to you. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no use at all. The word that I spoke to you are spirit and a life. So God may speak to you through his word as you pray. You won't run out of content for prayer. The Bible is very big. If I were to, if you were to tell me, okay, sit down and pray for an hour. Like I said, often, after a few minutes, I would have run out of things to pray. I just simply have got no idea what to say. But when you pray using the Bible, when you pray the Bible, you will never run out of content for prayer. The Bible is really, really big. And what I demonstrated to you just now using the two verses from Colossians is, is a snapshot that can go on for half an hour. And before I progress to the next verse, so that is how you can mutter the word of God all day long, day and night, night and day, day and night. So how do you pray for so long? Well, one secret is to pray using the Bible. Allow the Bible to set the agenda so that you don't have to do that. Right? That burden is lifted from you and you can just remain in fellowship with God. Praying the word helps you overcome mental drift. We've all experienced that. Uh, you're praying, you're praying, and you're praying. And before long, your mind wanders somewhere and all of a sudden, oh, what was I doing? What was I thinking about? I'm supposed to be praying, right? Is that your experience too? That, that is my experience. And that's also John Piper's experience. Uh, John Piper, in his article, Should I use the Bible when I pray? He says, If I try to pray for people or events without having the word in front of me, guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One negative thing is that my mind tends to wander. Uh, he gives a list of things, of, of negative things, and this is one of them. One negative thing is that my mind tends to wander, and I think instead about what I'm wearing, or, or that there is a Venetian blind that is halfway open, or, or that there is a siren out on the street, and I'm wondering what is happening. I'm jerked all over the place by my inattentiveness. But the Bible holds my attention because I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm reading it. I've said to people, you can pray all day if you pray the Bible. Some people wonder how you can pray longer than five minutes because they would lose things to pray for. But I say that if you open the Bible, start reading it and pause at every verse and turn it into a prayer, then you can pray all day that way. And I agree with Piper here. Uh, it's true. Uh, when you pray using the Bible, or the Bible is what you're praying, then you can pray all day because the Bible is that big, is that, is, is, is that thick. There's a lot of verses, and every verse is uh, it's like riches in those verses that you want to explore, that you want to unpack, that you want to expound and that you want to turn to God in prayer. Praying the word helps you internalize and memorize it uh, without much effort. If you're just saying, I, I want to memorize, I want to memorize this verse, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, well, it can get a bit difficult to, to remember. But if you pray using the word of God, uh, you meditate on it, you constantly mutter it. It's like almost like osmosis. You're just able to remember it, internalize it, and memorize it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do we allow the word of Christ to dwell in us richly? By memorizing it. And this is one way, one very good way to memorize. For he has delivered us out of the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom is redemption and the forgiveness of sins. See, it's effortless. Effortless. I didn't set out to memorize it, but hey, by praying God's word, it just sticks because every phrase meant something to me. 
Uh, one problem why we cannot remember the verses is because the verse is so external to us, it is so outside of us, that it has nothing to do with us. It doesn't intersect with our lives. So learning doesn't happen, memorizing doesn't happen. It's, the verse is out there, I am right here, it has nothing to do with me, I've got nothing to do with the word, and it just, you heard it, you read it, and then it disappears into the background, right? And, and that's the end of that. But if you turn it into prayer, you slow down, you take it verse by verse, you take it phrase by phrase, and you turn it into prayer to the Lord, and then it impacts you. The Lord speaks to you. And when the Lord speaks to you through His Word, then you remember. Because it's meaningful. It's interesting. It made sense. You remember the time you, you prayed this verse, and this verse came alive. And so you remember it for life. You remember the event, the situation in which you prayed this verse, and you remember the verse itself. The Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And praying the Word helps you know the Bible in a deeper and richer way. It is like, just now the preacher, his, his name is James Ong. Uh, he, he was my uh, roommate in seminary at some point. And one time we were traveling back from uh, PJ to Seremban. Uh, that's where our seminary was. So we, we did our weekend ministry and then we need to go back to Seremban. For, for, for classes to report report in. Uh, and he's a, he's a chef uh, and he, he's not just a chef he's a lecturer he was a lecturer who, who teach culinary arts he taught culinary arts and he was describing to me how to drink wine how to appreciate wine and basically, you take a, a glass of wine, you swirl it to look at the color, the texture, let it breathe, you smell it, look at whether it's transparent, does it stick to the glass, all kinds of things, right? So not that I'm an expert, I'm just listening from him. And then you take your first sip, right? You curl your tongue so that all, all the various uh, taste, your taste buds, right? All around your tongue, get to taste everything. Uh, you take your first sip to get a general understanding of what the wine is all about. A general understanding of what the wine is all about. So you then, okay, you take another sip to confirm what you thought you tasted the first time. Some of it were confirmed, some of it dispelled. So you get a clearer understanding and, uh, of what this wine is about. Now that you have some truth of this wine that is locked in your mind, you set that, you set that aside because what you want to do is that maybe you want to take a third sip to make sure it's still there. Ah, it's still there. Okay, then you lock it away so that when the next sip you take, you are looking for something else. You already know uh, what you already know. But you wonder whether did you miss out something? Is there some footiness uh, in the or, or some uh, uh, the taste of the barrel or I don't know what else is in there? And take the fourth sip, right? And you lock in something new, right? And then you keep on exploring, finding, 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 finding until you are satisfied that you have understood the richest, the deep riches of the wine so what you shouldn't do is bottoms up pum, right and that's how we treat the bible sometimes bottoms up and we just touch and go okay? and just down the whole thing ah i'm done with the book of colossians no 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 you want to let it breathe swirl it around look at the taste look look, look at the color look at all of it take the first sip And see how you feel about it and okay that is that thing and then you taste it again is it still there yes all right lock that in your mind search for something else and something else and you get a full um, the full aroma of that verse 
Then after that, you tick the label on the box of the of the wine uh, or the label on, that is uh, 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 that is on the bottle of the wine, and you read. It gives additional information uh, about uh, where the vineyard, which vineyard, which year, what kind of wine this is, and then you can look up Google uh, to to go deeper. And you can go as deep as you want to. Uh, what, you, what what was the rainfall of, of, of that year and this and that. Compare it with um, wine from a previous year from the same vineyard. You can you can you can you can go to ridiculous length. You can do that, but first enjoy the wine. The first thing we do is not hit the commentaries. Look up Bible dictionaries, maps, and all. No, 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 no. The first thing we do is to come to God's word in prayer, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word. Enjoy the whole thing, experience it all, and then we hit the books. <laughs> then we go to Wikipedia, and then we read the commentaries, uh, and, and, and all of that. Search out the Greek, the Hebrew, the whole thing. You can go as deep as you want. Uh, with it, but start with praying the word. <clears throat> praying the word is one way to be conformed to Christ more and more. Blessed is the one who meditates on the word of God day and night because that keep you away from being a scoffer, a sinner, a wicked person, a rebel. Rather, it conforms you more and more to Jesus Christ by allowing his word to dwell in us richly. You'll be like a tree planted in waters and fruitful, evergreen. Praying the word of God is one way to do that. That is why it is spiritual exercise spiritual discipline spiritual habit so that is praying god's word i say that calling on the name of the lord singing to the lord and praying god's word uh it's a it's a set it's a set for me calling on the name of the lord is like breathing it's any time all the time um, you don't have to have anything open or prepare. You just call and say, Lord, Lord Jesus, I love you. Lord Jesus, Savior of the world, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy upon me. Sinner. Lord Jesus, you are Christ. God has raised you from the dead, given you the name above all names. At the name of Jesus, Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Confess with my mouth, believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. The Lord is rich unto all who calls on him. That's like breathing, breathing, breathing. Singing is like drinking. You need air, you need water. Uh, so to me, singing to the Lord is like drinking uh, from the wells of living water therefore with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation and in that day shall we say praise the lord call upon his name declare his doings among the people make mention that his name is exalted cry out and shout thou inhabitants of zion for great is the holy one of israel in the midst of thee and so just just sing and sing uh, and draw from the well of salvation praying god's word it's like eating to me. It's like food because there's some substance there, right? Because you just call me saying sing to the Lord. We need to have some substance, the word of God, and you need to labor a little bit more. But it's nutritious, it's nourishing, it feeds you. Feed me, Lord Jesus. Give me to drink. Fill all my hunger. Quench all my thirst. Flood me with joy. With the word. Praying God's word. It comes in a set for me. These three are my uh, are dearest uh, spiritual habits 
to me. Maybe it's because I made them into habit. Other things. Okay, confession, confession of sins, of course. Um, but yeah. Next week, we would put things together uh, into meditate, prayer, memorize, proclaim. I call it MPMP. Uh, I, I, I designed this myself. Uh, meditate, prayer, memorize, proclaim. Uh, to put everything together and have at the end of it, not just a selfish me and Jesus, me and Jesus, but there's a proclamation component to it to go and tell it to the mountains. <laughs> go and tell it to the world. Go and make disciples of all the nations sharing the gospel, the riches of Christ. Okay, and that is for uh, next week. Paket says, I think the example from Colossians 1, 13 to 14, shared by you, which was really fantastic, is a combination of both a scripturally informed prayer and scriptural prayer. I think both are needed. Sometimes the actual words of scripture become the words of our heart in our prayer, scriptural prayer, but sometimes it can be empty as mere recitation uh, and not heart life connected. Sometimes the words of scripture inspire our hearts to use our own words to pray because we've experienced those words in our hearts, scripturally informed prayer. I think both types are prayer equally acceptable to God as they come from hearts. Yeah, uh, like the article from uh, the professor said just now, uh, we say that, he said, I'm not saying that, only pray scripture uh, uh, and, and not other forms of prayer. Paul says, take up the sword of salvation, which is the spirit, by means of all kinds of prayer. <laughs> all kinds of prayer we yield the the sword of the spirit yeah definitely bible very big how do we pick or choose uh so start with something that you're familiar with that you know the context that you wouldn't go crazy uh with uh that you you, you know what it's about for god so loved the world that he gave his you know what i mean so start with verses that you know verses that you have heard preached and you have uh that 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 that, that you will go wrong with lah uh, and it's easy. At some point, uh, when you start doing this, you cannot do, it'll be very hard to pray the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat, <laughs> right? Judah and his brothers and Judah begat. That's very hard. It can be done because that was what Nehemiah and his friends were doing, right? In Nehemiah 9, uh, they were basically just meditating on the whole story of, uh, of, of Exodus. I meditate on Matthew chapter 1 as a shortcut to meditating the whole Old Testament. Because I know every name in here, and I know the stories behind every name, right? So instead of turning open Genesis, Exodus, I just turn to Matthew chapter 1, Right, and as I as I as I read every word, as I read every name, right, I meditate on the stories behind those names that lead to Christ. Uh, but that would take a bit more. <laughs> it will take a bit more uh, practice. So uh, meanwhile, choose verses uh, such as Colossians 1, 13, 14. So the Psalms, a uh, great place. Proverbs, a good place. Um, the Epistles. Uh, um, many many treasures that you'll take it's enough for at least five years I would say to, <laughs> to, before you need to really expand into into uh, some of the more exotic stuff I don't think we read the scripture so we can know how to pray there are separate habits but as we know scripture more our prayer life will be enriched as scripture enters our prayer life yep absolutely uh, I'm not saying that, therefore, since I pray the Bible, I don't uh, read the Bible. But I have to confess that um, uh, I don't do the read five chapters a day uh, that way because uh, now I like depth, I like a lot of depth. So sometimes I dig one verse or a pericope and, and, and goes so so now I, I, I'm going for that but if you are not yet familiar with the Bible uh, 
plan, I would say the breadth, right? You need the breadth of it first. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, the breadth of it. Uh, read five chapters a day, something like that. And then uh, you after, after you're fam very familiar, then you don't seek for depth as well. Uh, so these are, uh, I guess it is correct, there is reading the scripture and there is uh, praying the scripture. And you can combine the two and pray read the, the, the scripture as well. Mm. Yeah, I was just responding to Liz, Liz's question in case Liz felt, uh, try, Liz try, right, the question, uh, oh. uh, Sister Liz, um, Lisa, sorry. Um, so I was worried that the idea here is unless I know scripture enough, I don't know how to pray. Um, so I don't think that's the point being made Oh, here, yeah, oh, oh, right, okay, I right? get it. Yeah, yeah, so because the Bible is so big, then I don't know which one to pray. But oh. we're not reading the scripture so that we pray here, we, you know, um, right, so right. sometimes when we engage scripture, it's, it's to soak in God's word into our lives, yeah. right? Not not to look for what to, I read this scripture so that I can pray on it or yeah. from it. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to distinguish the two sure. so that you don't have to worry la, that I don't know the scripture enough so I don't know how to pray. Uh, uh, that's now, not the point, I think. Now, yeah. if the question, the way I read the question, if the question meant uh, which, which the Bible is so big, right? Do I open up and then I, point randomly to a verse and pray that verse or or how so to pray the verses that you know uh one way to do that one way to do that one way to do that is that uh every week we have a sermon and sermon there's a bible verse somewhere in there that the preacher would expound on right so for example today is god is spirit he who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth okay now you know that verse so you you can and you and you know it reasonably well, uh, and you have some uh, appreciation of it. Uh, that can be uh, something. Uh, next week is gonna be the sheep and the goats. And so <laughs> that can also be uh, content for prayer. Yeah. Mm. Certainly doesn't mean all. Oh, so because I do not know the Bible enough, so I can't pray. That that's, no, that's not right. Uh, the main point of prayer is to draw near to God. Yeah. Like I said, it's not the music, it's not the lyrics, it's Christ. <laughs> that is who we worship. It's not, it's not about how we worship the music. It's not about it's not about how we sing the worship. It's not about what we sing the lyrics. It's about who we are singing to, uh, making melody to God in our heart. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Stephen. On that note, thank you, Stephen, and also Paiket for an all we have uh, yeah, shared during this time. And um, yeah, as Stephen has mentioned, uh, next week will be our concluding uh, session on spiritual habits. Uh, we have gone through uh, eight sessions, so next week will be a ninth and final session. So same time, 11.30 a.m. next week, we'll send out the Zoom uh, details to you again. Uh. So um, we'll now invite our brother Siu Kun to close us in prayer. Okay. After this, we will, yeah, okay. this. Thank you. Okay, shall we pray? Right. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time that we come together in a big group, Lord, that we can learn greatly from you through Brother Stephen Fong. Thank you, Lord, that today you reminded us that we can use your scripture in our world. Uh, daily prayers. Let us put into practice what we learned today so that we can have a connect to you every day. And like Brother Stephen said, we must mutter, repeat and repeat so that we will become internalized in us your words and memorize it and also conform to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that our mind will not drift into, uh, drift away or drift into a sinful thing. Let us always remember this, to put all these words into a practice, into our prayers, so that we will connect to you and internalize and memorize it. Praise you and thank you once again for uh, this morning uh, uh, lesson we learned through uh, Brother Stephen. We commit each one of us into a most holy hand, we will strengthen and, and bless us all. Let us put all this, what we learned today, into practice. 
We praise you and thank you. We pray all this in Lord Jesus Christ's most precious and mighty holy name. Amen. 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 Thanks, uh, Siokun. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And we'll yeah, catch bye. up with you soon again. Bye-bye.